all. Hi, I'm Kim Robinson, and I'm the moderator for today's press briefing on the release of a new report that is titled Increased Wellness and Economic Return of Universal Broadband Infrastructure, a telehealth case study of 10 Southern rural community counties, which details how universal affordable broadband infrastructure would return $43 million per year using telehealth across 10 counties in the Black Belts of Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. I am so excited to welcome members of the press and invited attendees to today's press briefing. Thank you so much for being here. We are very excited about the release of this report. Um, and this is the first of a series of conversations around this issue. Um, we have to discuss the report findings and the link between robust, reliable broadband infrastructure and access to healthcare. Um, and so I'm gonna list out the panelists that, that are here to speak on the issue in the order in which they will speak. Um, our first person up to speak on this issue will be Olita Fitzgerald, who's the board chair and regional administrator for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative for Economic and Social Justice, also known as SRBWI. And I say that because we're going to, it's gonna roll off uh, several people's uh, tongues. And I want you to know that that's just the acronym for our Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative. Um, she's going to be talking about why they did the report and who the constituents are um, and so how we saw this as a problem after a cancer study report and COVID. Um, next behind Alita, we'll have Rai, um, who is the report and lead co uh, report lead and co-author, along with in the audience will be an on panel at any time may speak. Um, it will be Christopher Mitchell as well. Um, and behind Rye will be Dr. Sandra Reed, who uh, works with obstetrics and gynecology with Emory Healthcare. Following Dr. Reed will be Dr. Kay Eady, who is SRBWI's Georgia state organizer, who will speak about the meetings that they've been ha that have been held so far and what citizens think about this issue. Um, following Dr. Eady will be Trudy Spears, who is an actual telehealth patient to give the lived health, the, the lived experience of going through and acquiring um, or, or working through our telehealth system as it currently exists. To wrap our call and bring it all home uh, will be Shirley Sherrod, who's our board member and our Georgia State Lead for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative, giving us general thoughts on how access to care and future funding um, can help to expand telehealth access. And um, after that, we will welcome and throughout this conversation, please members of the press, drop any questions that you have into the Q&A box. They will be held until the end of each um, of, of the actual program. And after each person speaks, um, we will move straight on to the next person, holding all questions to the end. We're not gonna annoy, uh, I mean, uh, ignore, um, other invited guests, we want to get your questions as well. We're going to give first dibs to the press, but feel free to um, use the Q&A box to ask any questions that you may have regarding this report. Um, and they can be entered, those questions can be entered throughout people presenting or talking and we'll hold them to the end. Uh, if you want to at the end, if you figure out something that you want to ask and it's a burning question, please just use the raise hand feature and we'll go ahead and uh, and have you recognized from the audience, but that will be held until the Q&A portion of this event. Um, just a panelist reminder, again, please only turn your videos on when you are called on to speak individually when you're prompted. And at the end, we ask that all speakers turn on the videos to answer press and audience questions. Um, so here we go, without further delay, we invite um, Olita Fitzgerald, who I mentioned before was, is the current board chair and regional administrator for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative. Um, and she'll be talking and giving us a little bit of information on why we did this report, who exactly the constituents are, um, and how they saw as an organization this problem after a cancer study that was released by SRBWI. And of course, how this issue has impacted many people throughout the COVID pandemic. So Alita, we invite you to speak. You're on mute, Alita.
Well, there you go. Am I here now? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kim, for uh, setting us up. And thanks to all of the members of the media that are on the call, along with uh, other guests. Uh, as Kim said, my name is Olita Garrett Fitzgerald, and I serve as the regional administrator for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative for Economic and Social Justice. SRBWI got its start back in the year 2000, actually, when a group of Black women came together, including myself and uh, Mrs. Shirley Sherrod, who will be speaking later and is a board member of SRBWI, uh, to talk about conditions in rural communities. We had all grown up in rural communities. We understood the disconnect between families and we continue to have families and relationships in those communities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So SRBWI is an organization that works across the black belts of Alabama and Georgia and the Delta and Mississippi. It is the first human rights agenda uh, organization focused on human rights in the United States uh, aimed to eradicate historical race class, cultural, religious, and gender barriers experienced by Southern rural black women and young women and girls. Over the past 20 years, SRBWI has engaged over 3,000 women and young women across 77 counties in the black belt in, in, of Alabama and Georgia and the Mississippi Delta. Uh, SRBWI got into the issue of expansion of broadband well before COVID, uh, in a report that re we released back in 2015, uh, that was a participatory report uh, engaging black women and girls across these counties. One of the things that was highlighted at the time was the need for affordable and quality broadband, uh, particularly focused at the time on education and whether or not our children were receiving uh, quality education uh, that would prepare them for work in the 21st century. Uh, and then COVID hit. And as you know, everything rolled out and we saw schools switching to virtual learning. Uh, we knew that we were gonna get hit hard in rural communities. Uh, the ARPA dollars that came in from the federal government that went to internet service providers in many instances uh, were not spent wisely. So it still did not allow children who were homeschooling, uh, if there was more than one child in the household or if it was unaffordable, uh, access to internet so that they could get their homework done. Uh, and then we entered uh, COVID. And one of the other issues that SRBWI is concerned with is access to healthcare. Uh, as as Kim uh, iterated. Access to health care in rural communities was also a major issue. Uh, as you all probably know, across the rural South, uh, we are having problems with hospitals closing. Prior to that, prior to COVID, uh, we don't have specialties in these areas. Um, in Mississippi, where we're doing work we just had the only NICU unit closed uh, in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, so we recognize through COVID and through our work in the region that telehealth is really important uh, to accessing healthcare in rural isolated communities. So as we joined uh, forces with Community Broadband's Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we decided to shift a bit from education focus to a focus on access to healthcare. And thus this report jointly uh, done with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative uh, that also included some participatory research. Uh, our concern, uh, we have a great opportunity. We got the, the best of times and what could be the worst of times. Uh, we've got resources coming into Georgia and the other Southern states in the billions of dollars. Georgia uh, is expected to receive somewhere around $1.5 billion 
from the federal infrastructure appropriation. And we know that Georgia has been actively engaging USDA funding and RDOF funding to advance um, broadband expansion. Uh, this report lays out uh, savings that can be had from expansion of telehealth if we have quality and accessible and affordable uh, broadband. Uh, so we are, this report joins in other organizing activities. Uh, we focused on uh, the counties in Georgia that are there that you have in your report, uh, primarily because we were looking at uh, Mitchell, the Mitchell Electric Membership Co-ops service area in the, as, as we were rolling out our work in Southwest Georgia. So I will stop there um, and turn it over to Rye and Chris um, to talk about the report's findings and, and why we think it's important to healthcare access as well as economic opportunity in these rural communities. Thanks, Alita. Go oh. ahead, Rye. Hi, everyone. My name is Rai Marcatilio. Uh, I am an historian of science and medicine and technology by training, uh, and I serve as uh, a senior researcher at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance working on broadband. ILSR is a national research and advocacy organization that works to build an American economy driven by local priorities uh, in pursuit of thriving and diverse and equitable communities. We work on internet access, energy, small business composting, and waste. So uh, this project looked at 10 rural counties across three states. Uh, it covers about 235,000 people, representing rough annual healthcare spending of about $3 billion. Uh, and just to give you a quick sense of need, uh, in two of the counties in this study, not a single household had access to what we would consider to be basic broadband service, equivalent to what you can get in any regular sized town or city in the United States. Uh, similarly, about one in five households across all 10 counties both bring in less than $25,000 a year in income and do not have health insurance. And so we knew our study region. From there, uh, we started with the research question. Uh, what data is there that's publicly available, uh, consistent across all 10 counties and three states, and could tell us anything about the potential of telehealth to save money and avoid costs with universal uh, affordable broadband infrastructure? We use sources like the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Kaiser Family Foundation, Federal Reserve Bank data, census data, et cetera. And we landed on five high impact areas where telehealth can save real money. These are hospital admissions, hospital readmissions, um, emergency department visits, lost productivity due to illness, and driving costs. And after running the numbers based on things like existing hospital use, and reported days of sickness each year across the 10 counties. Uh, we project in the report that robust telehealth delivered over reliable and universal broadband uh, infrastructure would result in $43 million in savings each year across the 10 counties. About half of that savings comes from recapturing lost productivity caused by illness. Uh, and then collectively the rest in order comes from emergency department visits at $13 million a year over the 10 counties hospital readmissions at five and a half million a year, hospital uh, and hospital admissions at uh, a little less than two million a year. So collectively that's $850 million in savings over 20 years with the money going back into local economies, into the hands of residents, uh, into publicly run or nonprofit hospitals, et cetera. Importantly in the report, uh, we did a before doing the report, we did a review of scholarly studies and what they suggested were the savings that we could get from telehealth. And then we did a review of the pilot programs uh, and existing telehealth programs that were out there and what they were actually seeing in savings. And so I say that because the report represents the most conservative numbers that both scholars and the industry uh, thinks good telehealth programs could save. For instance, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, has well-established pre-calculated uh, preventable admissions rates for hospitals already, uh, anywhere from five and a half to 10% of all admissions. In this report, we calculated saving just 
of those already identified preventable admissions through telehealth. Uh, similarly, uh, something like 30 to 50% of all heart failure patients in the United States get readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of surgery. Pilot programs out there have shown as many as 75% of hospital readmissions could be avoided with good telehealth programs. Here, again, in the report, we calculate just 10% avoidable because of telehealth. So we found we could save $43 million a year across all 10 counties, uh, and this is huge, but importantly, we need the infrastructure to do that telehealth. There are uh, about 90,000 households covered in the report, and 63,000 of those need that infrastructure to do it. The good news is that over 20 years, the infrastructure would pay for itself 10 times over by just the telehealth savings alone. And so that's what the report does. Each of the 10 counties also has its own fact sheet on healthcare costs and potential telehealth savings. And lastly, we built uh, an online calculator. I'm going to share my screen here. We built an online calculator that lives at srbwihealthcalculator.com, which lets folks do the math for their own county. All of the variables I mentioned here lift under, uh, live under this toggle variables button, uh, but we pre-populate one of them for you. You can hover over any of the tool tips here uh, to get more context. You can go to the sources page to find numbers for your own county, and then you can change the numbers and watch the potential savings grow at the bottom. You can reset each of the fields with a little button there or reset the entire page by hitting refresh. Uh, you can add variables and watch the totals grow at the bottom. And then there's a print report button on the top right that lets you print a PDF of all the values that you've entered. If you go to the sources page, you can find numbers for your own counties at each of these uh, each of these links. And if you're interested in diving deeper, you can go to the about page, and there is a link here which opens up the spreadsheet calculator that drives this website. Uh, you are free to download it, and uh, and you don't have to take our uh, assumptions for granted. You could say uh, maybe telehealth could save us five percent in savings, or fifteen percent, or fifty percent. And you can enter in any of the values you like and uh, and uh, watch the numbers change for your own area. Thank you all again. Again, my name is Rye Marcatilio. You can reach me if you have comments or questions at rye at ilsr.org. Back to you, Kim. Well, as these things go, um, a lot of times my video has been stopped and not able to work. However, I'm gonna go ahead and keep it moving and bring up our next panelist, which is Dr. Sandra uh, Reed, who is with Obstetrics and Gynecology at Emory Healthcare. And she's gonna discuss the potential benefits of telehealth and how she uses it and, um, and the future of telehealth as she sees it. Welcome, Dr. Reed. Thank You're you. Up. Thank you for this important uh, topic and bringing it forward. Um, as a practicing physician, um, I do see telehealth patients. Um, in the past, prior to COVID, telehealth required that the patient be in facility. But during the COVID pandemic, those requirements by HHS were lifted so that the patient, as long as they had access to video and audio, could be seen uh, virtually by their uh, physicians. Uh, not only does this help with the cost of health care in that these patients um, have to travel sometimes long distances in order for rural patients to be uh, referred to me. There's a, at least a three hour drive. Uh, transportation can be an issue for these patients and even setting up transportation, uh, missing their rides, appointments get uh, have to be rescheduled or canceled. Um, but as a physician at Emory, I do take care of patients in Tifton, Georgia, in other rural communities. Uh, but important to my past is that uh, prior to about seven years ago, I practiced 25 years in uh, Thomasville, Georgia, which is Thomas County, which neighbors Mitchell County. 
And over, we have seen over the last 20 years, many, many uh, labor and delivery units close in the state of Georgia. Um, we also know that maternal mortality rate is the one of the highest in uh, the three states that have been studied. Um, and having that opportunity to do these virtual visits would improve health care. It would decrease potentially uh, maternal uh, mortality. And we do know that Georgia is very high in um, maternal mortality. These patients, a, a lot of times, do not have the money to make the transportation to get to a facility so that they can be seen. Um, having the capability of doing telehealth uh, in their homes uh, is an important part of this, and uh, we can potentially uh, diagnose problems that the patient needs uh, immediate transfer for to a higher level of care if indeed they even have uh, health care in their county uh, for obstetrics um, services. So this is indeed an important topic. Um, having access, and I have had patients that I have not been able to see on, to see on telehealth because uh, lack of access to internet services. Uh, when that happens, these appointments have to be rescheduled. Um, the patient has to be set up transportation, um, or we have to refer to a, a facility closer to them so that they can at least make their visits. So uh, in a way, having the COVID pandemic escalated the um, speed with which we converted to telehealth. Um, and I am so glad to see this report, to pull the numbers together so that we can take this to our legislators and argue our case to continue telehealth uh, that does benefit the patient. It does benefit the cost savings for health care, uh, especially at a time when pri prices and, and health care is escalating in uh, expense. And this is an opportunity for us to not only um, give better access to patients, but also save on uh, the funding, which will uh, uh, allow those funds to be transferred for other important programs in the healthcare system. So uh, having practiced uh, in the rural communities, uh, it is definitely an area where we see um, the impact um, on these patients, especially the, uh, the population of patients who have more disparities and need more access um, to care. So um, I'm excited to be part of this program today. And if I can uh, continue to spread the word on this and uh, speak uh, about the um, opportunities available in healthcare, I'll be glad to do that. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. And um, you can go ahead and power down your, um, your video. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Kay Eady, who is Georgia's state organizer for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative. And what Dr. Eady is going to speak to us about this morning is about meetings that have been held, local community meetings, that have been held and um, and what she what she's hearing from the community. And then she's gonna talk about the report that kicked all of this off, um, which is a, a, a report that was done around cancer research. So without any further ado, um, Dr. Edie, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kay Edie. I am a community organizer for SRBWI. My work spans the rural communities of Southwest Georgia. There were a total of 10 meetings and 10 events that were held to promote, discuss, and advocate for telehealth in rural communities. The meetings range from local board meetings, health fairs, workshops, PTA meetings, First Friday events, and church events. Attendance varied at each event. Church events, receptions, and First Fridays were the top contenders for attendance. On average, each meeting had an attendance of 10 to 15 people. Women dominated in attendance, flanked by young adult and then men. Local government officials, educators, clergy, 
healthcare workers and private citizens were frequent in attendance as well. I remember distinctly how one senior citizen stated that she never thought she'd see the day when she would be able to visit her physician over the phone. She went on to say that this type of appointment really, really helped her because she had no means of getting to and from the doctor. I asked her if she would pursue other appointments of this nature in the future, and she assured me that she would. A frequent topic of discussion during these events was broadband. Many said they would have more telehealth appointments if broadband was available in their area. This discussion solidified the fact that there is a direct correlation between broadband access to care, telehealth, and broadband access in rural communities. In our report, We Need Access, Ending Preventable Death from Cervical Cancer in Georgia, 2022, women consistently reported that barriers existed that prevented them from receiving care and that broadband was a major issue. The women of Southwest Georgia consistently reiterated that telehealth could provide medical, could provide medical services when other options were unavailable to them. These powerful women said everyone should have equal access to healthcare regardless of their zip code. One person in particular, Ms. Mary M. Bellowed to me that telehealth should be a choice for everyone. Thank you, and I return to Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Edie. You can now uh, power your video down. Um, what insightful information. I don't wanna, um, I wanna keep the spirit of this moving uh, with and bring up our next panelist who was actually, who is actually a telehealth patient along with probably a ton of us on this actual call. Um, we're gonna bring up Trudy Spears and she's gonna tell us a lived experience of getting services and retaining services during uh, the pandemic. Ms. Trudy? Great. Uh, Thank you for having me on this panel this morning. I'm Trudy Spears. I live in Baker County, Georgia, with a population of less than 5,000 people. We are a widespread county, which is primary farmland. In rural communities, such as where I live, the internet is the way we can connect to the rest of the world. Unfortunately, the service I have doesn't have an upgrade for my area. There, are, there has been several companies with signs posted for high-speed internet, um, of them of high-speed internet, but none of them are affordable to me. Affordable internet services will benefit everyone. It can help us have access to so many things that we presently don't have. A few years ago, uh, during the pandemic, my healthcare provider tried on several occasions to set me up with a wellness checkup by internet. We couldn't get connected because of poor connections. So I had to go into the, bit, into the office for the visit and these kinds of visits most definitely uh, needs to be done by the internet. So several months ago, I received a postcard in the mail and it was about telehealth. It was a promotional program offering a small incentive. I was intrigued, so I called and they explained to me just what telehealth was. Uh, It meant that I can talk to a live doctor. I can choose a doctor from a volume of my choice and I can get recommendations, referrals, uh, prescriptions and questions answered. So I agreed to be scheduled for an appointment. They walked me through downloading the app on my phone. The day of the appointment, I managed to connect okay. I was on the call about 20 to 30 minutes. I come away from the telehealth call more informed about my issue than if I had had a face-to-face doctor visit. 
Doctors have so many patients scheduled today. They are in and out so fast, you very seldom get questions answered. Telehealth will be beneficial for everyone, especially those in rural areas uh, like mine, because some people don't have transportation. Uh, they may like mobility and lack of time spent with their hair care provider. Telehealth along with upgraded broadband services will make all our lives so much better because this is the future. And we need to be able to keep up with the changes. So rural com communities will have access to so many things available for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Trudy. And just for the press, because um, it was not, it's not displayed on the, the screen the way it would have on her own screen. This was Trudy Spears, um, who is a, a telehealth patient from Georgia, sharing her personal lived experience. Um, and so, Ms. Um, Ms. Trudy, are you available if any members of the press would like to speak to you individually? Yes. Okay. So you had you know that availability. Um, so now next, who we will you can power down the video. Um, um, we have Shirley Sherrod, who is a board member and the Georgia State Lead for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative um, for Economic and Social Justice that is going to join us. And she's going to talk about just access for care in her region, period, what that looks like and what the impacts have been and what the what funding could do um, for that act for the actual issue of broadband access and access to uh, telehealth care. Ms. Shirley, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And it's great to be with you this morning. I want to start out by mentioning that this is National Minority Health Month, which is a great time for us to be um, having this press conference to highlight many of the issues of minorities um, living in rural areas in the counties that are represented in this report. You know, the study has identified common health issues in the 10 counties and demonstrated the benefits that could come from effective telehealth interventions. It also includes savings costs that can be gained by reducing the cost of services that drive up higher costs today. In these rural counties, the potential savings add up, as, as was said earlier, to over $43 million. And it's interesting that the speaker before me highlighted Baker because that's also a county I want to um, highlight in talking about what savings could mean for these uh, for residents in these counties. Baker's population is is small. Um, the census would actually say less than 3,500. And um, as someone who grew up in that county, when the population was somewhere between eight and ten thousand. It's sad to see what happens in rural areas when resources don't flow into an area where people really, really need them. So the projected savings of 350,000 could make a very big difference in a county where the population is, is, is small. There is no grocery store there. There are three service stations that carry some food items. The closest service, the closest a uh, grocery store to Newton is nine miles away. That's to Newton. But if you go out into the rural areas, you could talk, you could be looking at anywhere from 15 to 20 to 25 miles away from the closest grocery store. The savings could help promote economic development there. The only industry I know that has located there in the last few years is, is, a, is a funeral home. There's nothing else locating in that county. So actually getting some savings that can be directed toward economic development that can help raise the standard of living for people in these rural areas, including telehealth, would, would be a major win for um, the people in that county. And then you can look at the same situation in other counties in, in Alabama and, and um, Mississippi. As you will see in the results of the study, 
new broadband infrastructure and enabling increased use of telehealth not only benefits the entire economy, but affords the array of other benefits that make broadband a social determinant of health. It unlocks workforce opportunities, makes independent businesses more competitive, and opens the door to micro business, all of which lead to higher area wages. It lets citizens connect with existing community resources and educational opportunities, improving community resiliency that leads to long-term benefits. It is important to see that it offers the chance to reshape healthcare delivery to meet people where they are, facilitating cheaper preventative care while also reducing the cost of chronic and acute conditions system-wide. Reliable high-speed internet is critical. Many of the residents in counties covered in the study live below the poverty level. Therefore, I want to restate that by saying reliable, by saying reliable and, re and affordable high-speed internet is critical. Internet financing is included in President Biden's $1 trillion plus infrastructure investment and jobs act. 42.5 billion is allocated to the broadband equity access and deployment program referred to as BEAD to improve broadband internet access in rural areas and make broadband more affordable for lower income households. The program should prioritize unserved areas first so that all Americans can benefit from an internet connection. The National Telecommunications and Inf Information Administration should work to prevent a confusing network of rules across the states, particularly for quality of service requirements. I think it is important for the press to continually write about the lack of broadband in rural areas including the barriers that getting all to getting all of the citizens connected. You know, so many of our population has now moved into urban areas. People forget about the, the rural areas. They do look there for the food that they eat, but then there's so many other issues for people living in rural areas, um, trying to survive while they help provide that food that many of the urban areas leave, um, deal with. Uh, keeping this issue on everyone's mind will help us advocate, help us as we advocate for a part of our population in need of the benefits of broadband, broadband from effective telehealth care intervention for as an example. So I'm hoping that once you get this study, you will begin to write more about the effects of the lack of, of of in broadband in our rural areas that also help to lead to um, making some of the issues we deal with in terms of health more acute. So thank you. All I can say is wow, wow, wow. Um, I believe that, um, and, and thank you Shirley so much for sharing those thoughts with us and you know just urging the press why this important is so issue and needs to this this issue is so important and needs to stay in front of them um, for continued conversation. Um, I'm going to bring Olita Fitzgerald back on screen um, to follow up with some additional thoughts uh, regarding some of what was mentioned. So, um, Olita. Yes, Kim. Uh, thanks, Shirley. That was wonderful. Uh, and we enjoy our, our partnership with Southwest Georgia Project so much in the work that we're doing. Uh, just wanted to come back and say that this is, this is the best opportunity we are going to have to ensure that broadband gets into our communities um, and into the homes of people that are, have been left out. If we are spending, the federal government spending one, over $1.5 billion and money that's grant money that will end up in the hands of internet service providers. 
We have to be very careful and very certain that these internet service providers will be providing services at a reasonable cost and, re and will reach all of those families that are in rural communities that are unserved. Um, the, there is a clock ticking on this and SRBWI will continue to work with our local communities, our organizers and our partners to make sure as much as possible that these resources land where they are intended. Uh, so thank you all for being here and we look forward to your questions. Speaking of questions, it's that time. Um, we have a couple of questions in queue and um, I'm gonna go ahead and we are going to bring, we're gonna ask all the panelists to please um, turn their videos on so that we can move to the Q&A portion of it and amongst yourselves, um, everyone can decide who would answer this question. But our first question um, comes, uh, comes in and asks, is the problem of people not having insurance being factored into quote unquote obstacles to telehealth? Also, has SRBWI been looking at the cost for telehealth related digital tools such as digital stethoscopes, scales, and blood pressure monitors? These tools add to the cost of telehealth to individuals. Great question. Whoever wants to tackle that, it sounds multi-layered. Um, it sounds like some of something that SRBWI could answer and something um, maybe Rai um, with, uh, uh, with ILSR can. So um, whoever wants to go first, jump in. I can, I can start with that and then somebody else can jump in as well. Uh, it's a great question, Craig, and absolutely. Uh, not having access to health insurance or good health insurance uh, plays a role here. Um, your question makes me think of a pilot project at uh, um, out, of, out of Philadelphia, uh, where uh, it was called Jeff Connect. The project let people come in and do a quick telehealth visit uh, for a flat $49 fee, independent of any health insurance uh, at any time of day. And the study found that uh, 74% of the participants of that program didn't seek any further medical care. Uh, and so to some extent, it obviates the need uh, to deal with health insurance. Um, you know, to some extent, uh, those people's co-pays may have been more than $49, uh, but this is a complicated and ever evolving uh, issue, especially now um, that we are three years after the start of the pandemic. So um, it's a great question. Now, don't everyone jump in at once? Okay, yes, I'll leave Shirley, this the SRBWI. Uh, Shirley, you want to go on that one? No, I, I'll let you go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative, uh, as I said earlier, we're working across these three states and rural communities. All three of these states have failed to, um, to expand Medicaid. Uh, so it is one of the issues that SRBWI has been feverishly trying to uh, advance uh, so that, you know, we have a lot of working poor families who don't have access to health, health insurance or health care. And in addition to some of the cost savings that have been pointed out in this report, uh, there are cost savings to be had for uncompensated care that, um, that these communities experience as a result of people not having access to health care. Uh, so ultimately health insurance would, uh, uh, more people having health insurance would undergird a strong health care system um, that would keep our hospitals from closing and our specialties from leaving, but even so, in rural communities, just as with education, we don't have a lot of specialties rushing to set up office in these rural counties. So even with the with a strong rural hospital system, we're still going to need to be able to connect to people who specialize in, in certain forms of medicine. Uh, additionally, in these areas, we have high rates of diabetes, uh, obesity, and other issues uh, that could be more handily managed uh, if we had telehealth. 
And I would like to see if, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Dr. Reed is not, has she left the call? I'm here. No, Dr. Oh, Reed, yes. you okay, want to you you jump in there, Dr. Reed? Yeah, you know, the medical um, community is working feverishly to try to maintain telehealth because of the lifting of certain restrictions on telehealth during COVID, which are now reversed, including Medicaid expansion during the um, crisis, which has now been lifted. So a lot of our patients who have been covered the last two to three years under the Medicaid system are going to lose that. Um, and so it, it it's a multifactorial process to, to maintain telehealth. Uh, the other issue is that we need to make sure that patients can access telehealth from their homes and not have to be in a healthcare facility because a lot of times, even with broadband, they don't have the um, funding to be able to make their appointments in a healthcare facility. And those rules were lifted under COVID and we're working as a medical society um, in the state of Georgia, as well as nationally through the AMA to bring recognition to this and maintain um, health care uh, through telehealth. And you're absolutely correct. Um, the, the specialties access uh, is expanded to a greater degree through telehealth than um, patients who do not have telehealth. Uh, the unfunded patient is another uh, battle that all of us need to be fighting as far as um, Medicaid expansion uh, and your healthcare community as far as the medical societies and most uh, medical uh, national organizations have come out very strongly that uh, Medicaid expansion should be done. Uh, so that we can expand coverage to these patients that are underserved um, and that, that they can have access to appropriate health care and the appropriate specialties. Okay, so we're going to try to get the last questions answered really quick. As we are approaching the hour, I want to be mindful of keeping time for all of our press um, attendees. So the, Olita, this question is specifically for you. It's from Courtney Ann Jackson, WLBT, um, here locally in Mississippi. Um, Olita, we heard a lot about Georgia, but can you span, expand more on the potential Mississippi impact? Uh, Rye, I'll call you in to, to answer uh, the Mississippi impact and just, but Courtney Ann, let me say that we started rolling out this report in Georgia. Uh, we wanted to get it in uh, during the National Minority Health Month, but we will be having follow-up press conferences in both Mississippi and Alabama, and we will be sure to let you know when, when those are scheduled. Um, the impact in Mississippi is, is much the same story as, as uh, Dr. Sherrod talked about in rural Georgia. Uh, we have, uh, and one of the reasons we joined together to work across these three states, the indices uh, and, on economic well-being and health care are similar in these counties. The economic development um, activities or a uh, non-activity is similar. So, uh, Ra, I'll switch to you just to, if you can just pick up a bit on, uh, I know I'm throwing you a curveball here, but on the Mississippi savings from the report. Yeah, so uh, to answer the question as briefly as possible, uh, for the two Mississippi counties in the report, LaFleur County and Sunflower County, 76% uh, of households don't have access to fast enough internet access to utilize uh, telehealth services the way that they need to today. Um, if we're looking at savings uh, in Mississippi, annual savings look like uh, $11 million across all the uh, variables that we talked about over 20 years, that is a little less than $250 million. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rai. Um, uh, Kim, let me, let me say that we can get Courtney in the fact sheets on the counties in Mississippi. We didn't have them, I don't think, in this press packet, but we will get you that information. And also to say that 
as with Dr. Edie in, uh, in Georgia, we have um, an organizer in the Mississippi Delta that's working in these counties. Our focus in Mississippi had been prior to the infrastructure legislation passing around the Delta Electric uh, Power uh, Service Area, which is LaFleur and Sunflower County. But we have expanded our work greatly, uh, though the report won't cover those counties. We are now uh, investing and in organizing in 15 counties in, uh, in Mississippi with other partners. So we'll give more on that, but I'm happy to talk to you later. And you guys, um, as members of the press, will be first to, I mean, you are the first to get the actual resources that, um, that come along with the report. So expect that you will get these. Um, if you haven't gotten it, expect that it will be, there'll be a follow-up email that will be coming, that will have it. Um, and it'll, well, this video will also be available for you um, at a later time whenever we get it uploaded to our websites. Um, next question is from Sarah Tribble. I, I can't recall who it was, but it said, you mentioned the BEAD program. Why specifically focus on that program as opposed to other federal telehealth and broadband initiatives? It was, uh, you know, I, uh, Kim, I mentioned the BEAD program, but it was just one using an example of what's out there. There's so much and so much we can focus on in terms of trying to bring attention uh, to the issues and problems of the rural area. So it was just using one program to talk about it, but definitely not uh, ignoring other resources that are out there. Thank you so much, Shirley. That is absolutely true. Um, and and, and in, our, in our, a lot of our meetings and publications that come from SRBWI, that information is given live on site. And so, um, but I will, look, I, I will send everybody to ILSR.org because it has a lot of descriptions and um, information around um, what other federal programs are out there that can assist. Um, they're Kim, actually, they're, I, go ahead, oh, Rye. Sorry, Kim, I was just gonna add on to that real quickly. Uh, so I, I was gonna, uh, to answer the question also, um, federal telehealth programs are often hospital focused. They certainly do good. But uh, as we've heard time and time again uh, throughout the course of doing this report, um, the challenges can be as simple as lots of hospitals don't even know which patients have home internet access capable of sustaining some sort of uh, telehealth uh, telehealth service. Um, to answer why B uh, and instead of other federal telehealth or federal broadband grant programs, uh, BEAD is many is larger many times over than uh, any other federal grant program. Uh, it's a truly once in a generation uh, investment in our broadband infrastructure. Um, and as was mentioned earlier here, um, the bead uh, bucket of dollars represents a lot of money uh, and will solve this connectivity problem for many households. But our biggest concern here would be uh, affordability. Uh, bead is going to lead to many, many new connections, but it's administered through the states and the states have wide latitude as to which internet service providers get those public dollars to build new connections. Um, the national monopolies have a long history, the national ISPs have a long history of charging more to exactly the communities who can't pay as much, uh, leaving lots of households out. Um, and so those are not the, those ISPs are not the only vehicle through which we could solve this problem, especially in rural areas. Uh, as Alita mentioned, um, electric cooperatives have a long history of uh, building out infrastructure, even in the hardest to reach places. And uh, they are locally accountable to the populations that they serve in ways that um, uh, the national companies are not. Thanks, Rai. So we're going to go ahead and shoot out the last question um, so we can get those members of the media that might need to log off. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Alita. You, you had a follow up? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say this issue of internet service providers that I uh, raised is one that the press really should uh, should pay close attention to and, uh, and affordability because these are, it's like $65 billion that is going to go into the coffers of these internet service providers to help underwrite the cost of building out, the, building out these systems. Uh, much like the federal government invested in electrification back in the 1940s so that it was affordable for those companies uh, because companies, the investor-owned utilities did not want to get into that business because it did not 
provide them high margins of return. Uh, what we have to be co uh, uh, conscious of here is that when these internet service providers uh, receive this huge amounts of money that is federal grant money, that they should, be, should not be charging families costs that are unaffordable. This is a reason for the program in the first place. So this is not a national model. This is not a regular business model where we're, companies are coming in and we're asking them to go the extra mile to reach people out in rural areas. They are getting free money. Uh, so, uh, so we just want to be sure that, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be one kink in this plan. Also, we need to make sure that these companies who are administering this access are actually supplying the bandwidth that uh, they are promising, because in a lot of places in the more rural areas, um, the bandwidth has promised, but when you actually check the numbers, they are much, much lower, and the internet access is a lot, uh, it's spotty and difficult for um, participants to use. So we need to make sure as well that they are producing and delivering the uh, what they are, have promised. Okay, I am going to go to the last media question that I have coming in. Any future questions or additional questions um, outside of the one that's come in? Cora Burnside, I see your question. I just want to give preference to the press first. Okay, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna let yours be answered live too, Sarah. So we'll go to Craig first and say, is there? Um, Craig has a question for the group at large. Whoever is a subject matter expert here or can answer quickly, um, go ahead and respond because we're starting to lose a couple members of the press. I wanna make sure that we get full coverage. Is there any kind of directory of pilot programs that are set up for telehealth? It seems that pilots are great opportunities to learn and also to advance telehealth. That's, that's from answer, that's from Craig Settles. I'm certainly not uh, an expert in this, Craig. Uh, there are kind of uh, collections of uh, pilot telehealth programs out there. The FCC has a Connect to Health uh, website where there is some um, kind of like large scale overview efforts at mapping uh, broadband as it relates to healthcare disparity in the United States. They also fund pilot programs all around the country, but I don't believe that there's any national uh, directory of pilot programs relating to telehealth out there right now. Thanks, Ryan. Um, well, then we might wanna think about that in the future. Okay, so Sarah has a quick follow-up, and that's Sarah Tribble. Um, will you follow-up packet, in, well, oh, will the follow-up packet include information on each of the panelists? Thanks so much. We didn't plan on doing that, but we can actually put together a little bio list for, so that you can have information for everyone, but we'd like to keep the press contact to our friends over at America, America Forum and um, let them field all press questions. So um, we're gonna keep that um, the way that it is. So thank you so much for that question. Okay, um, I'm gonna go quickly to, um, we. I'm, I'm just gonna say thank you to our human rights commissions. Um, we hadn't really gotten a chance to explain exactly what these women do, but they work and lead these messages and take these messages and this information into their communities, disseminated amongst people in their community who wouldn't have access to a Zoom to log on. So I want to add, I want to um, put out there Ms. Cora Burnside's question, who is one of our human rights leads. Um, should your broadband company supply services for parks? And I'm thinking she means parks and recreation departments for children. Anybody? So lots of communities that uh, operate their own broadband networks do this. They connect all uh, you know, internal buildings, not only for parks and services, but for local electric grid savings and traffic safety uh, and all that stuff. Um, it's definitely a, a good place to connect to folks that you would not otherwise be able to reach or who face affordability or connectivity challenges in their homes. Thanks, Rai. Thanks to all of the panelists for your time today and your in extreme knowledge in the area in which you, you gave information. And um, we will be calling on you in the future. As we've mentioned, this is just a first of a series of conversations 
um, editorials, op-eds, media events, and community events to discuss this issue. Um, we appreciate you. Everyone else that is not Olita Fitzgerald or Shirley Sherrod um, can power down their, um, their videos. Again, I say thanks. And we're gonna leave it to Olita and Shirley to wrap us up. Go ahead, Shirley. I think we have, uh, we've, I've talked to them. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is an issue that uh, I've, in addition to my organizing for so many years here in, in rural Georgia and across the, the other, some other Southern states dealing with farm issues. Um, I, as we were talking, I thought of a man that I know here who had trouble um, urinating and didn't couldn't go to a doctor, didn't have insurance, didn't know what to do. And because we had cared for my husband for so many years before he passed, he called my daughter and talked to her and she finally got him to go to um, the emergency room. And they gave him a catheter he couldn't follow up with a doctor because he didn't have insurance. So he was wearing the catheter around and trying to still cut yards and so forth. It's just, there's so many, so many issues for people in, who, are, who don't have sufficient income and are not connected and don't know who to call and who to turn to. If this issue of telehealth and broadband could really be helpful in moving us forward. You know, most of our folk want to live in the rural, I mean, in the urban areas now. So rural is sort of being forgotten. We got to bring more attention to what's happening here to try to help make a difference for people who chose to stay and work in this area. So thank you. As we close this, um, this first of many conversations out, I just want to say thanks. There are a lot of people that come into pulling this together really quickly. And as Alita and Shirley mentioned both, um, this is National Minority Health Month. And we, we did have to put this together um, and get this report ready faster so that we could be in, a in line with this month. But to put on an event like this, it takes a lot of people behind the scenes. So we've got to give some additional thanks, number one, to the, I mean, I, additional thanks again, to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance for their hard work on this report. They're always willing to be a gracious partner and they're always willing to come when we call. Um, but there are some Southern rural black women out there that are some staff members and consultants that work directly for this organization that do a yeoman's job pulling together a lot in a small amount of time. So I can't mention them all, but I will just tell you they are mighty, fierce, and they work hard. Thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, in order to have press turnouts, you've got to have a great media management uh, presence. And so we thank American Forum for their partnership. Um, it has been great to work together and um, it's amazing what one person can do. <laughs> Kim, okay, let, so let, me, let me add that we have to give Yeoman's thanks to Sarah Barbara Williams who's a senior consultant with SRBWI, with, without whom this wouldn't have happened. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Amen. And with that being That's said, it. follow up to the, press con uh, to the press contact on your media advisory list with any other questions or requests for interviews. And that'll be all for today. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, attendees. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. You're welcome. Great job. Bye -bye.